So as, as he was saying, I'm Doug Turnbull. I wrote the book Relevant Search. Here's all of my information. I work for a company, Open Source Connections, where we help search teams reach their highest potential in terms of uh, mostly that means relevance and delivering higher value for their customers as in consulting. And my name is Tomaso Teofili. I work for Adobe as a computer scientist and also an Apache Software Foundation member. Uh, in, yeah, I'm very interested in the search field and uh, topics. And you're writing a book. Yeah, I'm writing a book. Search, yeah, but it's, so. yeah. It's, in, it's on MIP now, so I hope to be, that to be finished by the end of this year. So, so yeah. I mean, plain paper. <laughs> it's exciting when you get it in paper. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about deep learning and search, and can deep learning be a thing that can really have a big impact in the search landscape? And I want to talk, start by talking about, I'm going to run through some slides, and for me personally, this is doing this talk has been an educational opportunity, and one of the things I always try to imbue to people is you don't have to be a deep expert in a topic like deep learning or machine learning NLP to give a talk. And often the best speakers are people and bloggers and that sort of thing are people actually learning as they're going. Um, so I want to I say that to encourage other people to feel like they should feel safe giving a talk even, even when they're becoming familiar with a topic. So there we go. <coughs> so what often happens with search, this is a very common problem in search. There's kind of two specific things that I'm going to talk about. One is this matching problem. Almost all of my search clients that we work with have a vocabulary mismatch problem where you have searchers and this is like somebody, this is basically how my dad would search the law, they're searching for a dog catcher and you have a bunch of laws that say animal control law, right? And, um, and, <clears throat> and this is a common problem in search and we spend a lot of time trying to work through these problems. And I really liked Giovanni's talk this morning that was about a lot of the you know, manual search management that we do. And in a lot of our work, we see the same kinds of things where it's actually one of the secret bullets of relevance is to have a great taxonomist or librarian who's manually curating the mapping between how searchers consider, uh, talk about their content and how the corpus talks about the content. And I have a talk, taxonomical, semantical, magical search that uh, I gave that if you're interested. <clears throat> this is uh, obviously one of the things I'm curious about is I also have many clients who just don't want to get involved in this kind of work or, they, or the domain is too large to really build a, this kind of controlled vocabulary taxonomy to solve this problem. And so deep learning is exciting to me from that point of view because you see this is sort of a feature engineering thing, a manual feature engineering thing. And one of the th big themes in deep learning is for text and images, there's all these latent rich features. Why are we creating all of these manual features for these things when deep learning helps us learn these abstractions? Right. Ranking is sort of the other side, so you think of matching and ranking. And of course, ranking is very challenging. We have all of these ways of querying our our search engine, Solar and Elasticsearch, they have a very rich query DSL. We are always fine tuning these things, right? There's all these weird heuristics, TFIDF, Solar Elasticsearch. I mean, TFIDF is just some like thing that came, this, you know, so I, I, there was, I was on a Twitter thread once where someone was saying, people who don't really understand how search works, um, they do all these hacks, but I'm pretty sure that everyone, including me, when they're actually solving a real relevance problem, everything feels like a hack. And that goes for TFIDF too. I mean, TFIDF is a statistic that just came out of people playing with numbers until it turned out it was the best given some relevance judgments. And all of these things are kind of like heuristics for getting close to what the user wants. Whereas in deep learning, <coughs> deep learning helps us sort of um, maybe get deeper than that. And of course, we have learning to rank, and learning to rank is a bit, is a different field than deep learning. But learning to rank isn't perfect either. Learning to rank comes with its own problems. It's only as good as your features, and those features, of course, are just based on this stuff. So if, if your features aren't mapping between dog catcher and animal control officer, you're still gonna have problems. 
the first thing, the first stop on our deep learning journey, and, and when I look at these, and again, I'm inspired by what you see in deep learning for NLP, deep learning for images, are there ways to do, to learn better feature representations that aren't based on things that are sort of a, a layer of abstraction that maybe a machine would learn, but aren't in a language that we could access? <laughs> And how many people have used Word Devec before? I think Word Devec. So, <clears throat> so how many people have used Layton? Let's see if I can say this right. Dirichlet allocation, LDA. Yeah. So you have these sort of so these sorts of topics, and you can build what are called embeddings out of them. <clears throat> and embeddings are great because what you're doing with them is you're remembering something about the context that those words tend to appear in. Um, <clears throat> and you know. I swear I did this without knowing what the keynote talk was, but cryptocurrency is hyped, question mark. It appear in, you know, Bitcoin and hype seem to appear in similar context. And one of the great things about word embeddings is they're, they're recording this information. And you have these situations where cancel and confirm are actually appearing in similar contexts. <clears throat> so word embeddings are really vectors, right? They're n-dimensional vectors in a, some vector space. And of course, they're probably not two-dimensional vectors. They're probably uh, often 300-dimensional vectors is a number that jumps out a lot. But when you map them in a vector space, you can see th words that occur in similar contexts occur together. This is the goal of a good embedding. And um, same, you see that in both situations. Uh, of course, search is also based on a vector similarity, right? We have our query up there, and we try, we have our query terms, you know, regulation. We're trying to find the documents that are about regulation. We're trying to find the documents that are about Bitcoin, right? And upper right, you know, sort of represents our query. The farther in the upper right we get, the more about the document is to our query. And so we sort of have this notion that aboutness is TFIDF for each of these terms. And so the closer our doc gets to having more of each, the more it's gonna be rated relevant because it's closer to where our query is. <clears throat> this is also a kind of vector similarity. And of course, the question that often comes out, this is a hypothesis, and I, I claim it, I say it as a hypothesis because I want to be clear that, you know, I have gone down the chain of saying, I'm going to take my data straight out of word devec latent semantic analysis, LDA, and just put it in my search engine and everything will just be fine, right? And the hypothesis is that this embedding similarity, um, where we have, maybe we've done the same thing with our documents and it has, you know, we have an embedding for a document, but this embedding similarity is somehow related to this aboutness similarity that relevance tries to capture. <clears throat> and this is a hypothesis that works out sometimes. You can see on the bottom right, it appears, appears to be working. However, in some, this hypothesis does not always hold, and this is something important to take away. You know, this is a great example. I actually heard this, you know, chatbots do a lot of um, support, and this is a very related field is, that uses a lot of embeddings. Answering the question, I would like to confirm my, my reservation, and you respond with, oh, are you sure you want to cancel your reservation? Is, is a bad, that's a bad time. You're having a bad time. <clears throat> so this hypothesis doesn't always hold, and it's important to know that it's a hypothesis. It's also important to know that TFIDF itself is a hypothesis measurement of aboutness. I should say that, you know, that often doesn't work out too. Um, <clears throat> so context alone isn't enough, and I think it's good to point out, and this comes up a lot in Tommaso's book, there are ways just in the same way we do a lot of data modeling in search engines, there's actually a lot of things that you do before your data gets to word -Devec. One thing that comes up that's actually in the word -Devec paper is they make sure to pull out the, uh, the, the entities, the phrases, that you should really consider one thing. So Boston Globe is treated as one word in that vocabulary. That's in the original word -Devec paper. Bo so that you're not confusing Boston Globe, the newspaper, with Boston, the city or globe. They're treated as separate. 
So, and there are other things to do. We could, we could use other factors of our words, uh, the sentiment of the language, you know, confirm and cancel may, usually will have different senti uh, uh, sentiments with cancel, obviously, maybe someone's yelling at the search engine or something, uh, synonyms and all kinds of other ways of doing this. Uh, parts of speech is another one. <coughs> so, one, one low-hanging fruit <coughs> is, uh, do you want to talk about this slide really Sure. Quick? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think one of the um, uh, key things in this talk is, is also, I mean, getting, um, there's two things. Uh, one thing is getting a general understanding of how uh, deep learning can be useful in the context of search, but the other thing is also kind of uh, get a, a few quick ideas or things that uh, um, you as the audience can try out in your projects. So um, that, that's the idea about uh, the so-called low-hanging fruits. So, uh, so if the probability distribution of words in the corpus can provide enough information, uh, to predict whether two words appear in similar contexts, and that's uh, exactly the slide that Doug just uh, showed up, uh, then we can kind of use them as synonyms, or, I mean, not uh, strictly synonyms in the way uh, they taught us to school to think about synonyms, but basically things that uh, make sense to see, uh, um, uh, that, that uh, words that make sense uh, to be used to replace one another. Um, and that's kind of the que query expansion kind of thing. Um, so and that, that's one thing where you can use uh, kind of uh, adjusted versions of word to vec for example, or basically word embeddings that also can, uh, takes, uh, take in, uh, in account um, sentiment or other things that uh, can mitigate the problem about, for example, cancel and confirm, uh, and then you can you can use them to uh, learn query expansion, um, very very effective uh, query expansion algorithms that you can use under the hood. So that's the idea about uh, so cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I mean, you cannot type, you can, you may not type cryptocurrency in the in the query. But the, uh, the search engine would um, turn it into Bitcoin under the hood and find two different queries, uh, two whole queries with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin using that. Uh, and this is kind of expected to raise the, um, the recall. Yep. So <clears throat> there can often be still a mismatch because when people use word to vec or all of these tools, when they're building embeddings, they're still fundamentally using their corpus to do this for the most part. Uh, usually they're running it against a corpus and they're learning similarities and legalese and not lay speak. So still we have the same problem and may not, may not solve that, this, uh, that problem for everything. And it depends a lot. Everything depends, and I'm a consultant so I say it depends. Uh, it depends on what your corpus is and how, how much overlap there is between your search language and your corpus. If you're supporting lawyers, maybe great. If you're supporting non-lawyers, may not be great. So one thing I ask myself a lot is can we build, our first step on the neural network train is can we build better embeddings? Can we build embeddings that get closer to our searcher's notion of relevance? You know, maybe. <clears throat> so, you know, and I think it's a good, this is a good thing. I think everyone, I'm gonna go through exactly how this stuff works. I sort of feel like they should, pretty soon they'll be, they should be teaching this stuff in high school, like this machine learning stuff. It shouldn't just be about coding. We need to get to this stuff in high school, and I think it's anything, something anyone can really understand. So the word to vec model is relatively straightforward, and it's a great thing to start, to start to learn about when you're doing this kind of machine learning. And once you learn about it, then you can hack it and do crazy things with it. You basically have this very simple table that's storing an embedding for each term, in this case, energy and Bitcoin. And we're taking those terms. We have a dot product. And you can imagine this is initialized randomly. This may not even be, it's a, just a poor model. Take a dot product, which is just that math up there. A sigmoid, which really just forces everything to zero to one. And 
if it's close to one, it's the prediction of the model that this is a true context, that this is something, these are true context words. Close to zero, the prediction is it's a false context, it's not an actual context word. So maybe if Bitcoin and energy were in the same context, the model predicted 0 0.67, okay, we're get, we have some, it's close to, you know, if we think about this prediction as a probability of being in the same context, uh, of occurring in the same context, then, you know, we're two thirds of the way there. Um, and the goal is, the arrow's got a little misaligned, but the goal here is, as we, now that we have, maybe we randomly uh, set this up, but we know the real answer. And when we're training, the goal is to shift the stuff that's in the true context up and move the stuff that's not actually sharing a context down. We want this number, this prediction to go down. We want that prediction to go up. So our model becomes more accurate. And uh, this is using, a, I think, this is using an interesting approach called negative sampling, which I think is the easiest to get into. And what negative sampling does is say, okay, I've got this term Bitcoin I'm trying to learn about. I've got a true context word for my training data, and I'm randomly selecting some negative words that I know don't occur with that. And what's interesting about this is learning to rank also has an issue where it's very important to have lots of negative training data. And so there's, there's some like interesting uh, symmetries here or something in the universe that we're learning about. And the question is, how do we tweak this? And so we have this big scary math thing. And you don't need to be intimidated by this big scary math thing. But what is happening is, and I'm just gonna go ahead and, these, that, this stuff in here, that's just the model that I just told you about. One over one plus E to something is a sigmoid. V, C are a dot product of two embeddings. In this case, it's the true context. And we take away, you know, this is what we want to go up, the true context, because this is what our, per, you know, <clears throat> this is what we want to go up. We want this value to go up and these values to go down. <clears throat> and so this whole function is designed to be maximized. Okay, so, you know, how do we, how do we maximize that? And I'm not going to get into the, to the weeds of gradient descent, or in this case, ascent. But the idea is if we take the derivative of that function we told you about, we know which direction in each of our, the V here is the Bitcoin, in each of our Bitcoin's direction to push that number, to make that, that, uh, the, that loss or that likelihood higher that we're getting something more accurate. And then you talk about this idea in deep learning of backpropagation. So backpropagation is where we take that, that thing we learned about, about this loss function, and we propagate it back to the other weights. And deep, of course, you may know that deep learning, this deep, it, when we do deep parts of it, we actually have several layers of, of things to keep propagating back and back, and hopefully keep maximizing or minimizing, we say minimize the loss, in this case it's maximizing something. <clears throat> so that's what, when you hear people talk about back propagation, it's really just sort of doing this kind of learning. And there's not magic here, it's just math. It's math that uh, I feel like if more of us understood, we would all make better decisions in our jobs, in our lives, and uh, fall for the silly AI advertising a bit less. Because people will say, this is, is this AI? I don't know. <clears throat> of course, we can do the same kind of thing with, uh, documents. In this case, uh, this Doctovec uses what's called paragraph embeddings. And a paragraph could be a whole document, it could be a subset of a document, and we can do the same kinds of things. So we can tweak these guys, you know, here is Bitcoin, here is a true document that it occurred in, and we can tweak that prediction to be up. Here's Bitcoin and a document it, that is unassociated with it, and we want that prediction to go down. Um, <clears throat> And in this, co in, in this model, you know, right now this is still tweaking the Bitcoin vector, but you're, you are learning both the document embeddings, the paragraph embeddings, and the document at the same time. If you notice, I'm leaving you Easter eggs in the upper right. If you get these slides, you can click on links and follow to learn more stuff. So you wanna take sure. this one away? So um, these are the low-hanging fruit. Um, so similar word embeddings lie close to one another. 
I mean, similar in semantics. So that's the, the kind of um, results of uh, word word to vec and other uh, kind of uh, similar algorithms about word embeddings. And the same stands for paragraph vectors uh, and document embeddings in general. Um, so, and other uh, research have shown that um, uh, words appear um, often close to the documents that they are more re representative to. So, if uh, uh, again, if we think about uh, to, uh, to to LDA and uh, how we can we can kind of think of using that together with word embeddings uh, to discover uh, topics about uh, about documents by just looking at the. Um, uh, position of words into this embedding space. And um, so, um, but uh, as, a, as a search engineer, if you think about your search project, um, we've always, or I mean, we've mostly uh, used our time thinking about terms and analyzers and tokenizers and filters and stuff like that, just to, to speak the Lucene APIs, in the Lucene APIs. Uh, so is this going to uh, change all, all of this? So did anyone say terms when, we, when it, com it comes to retrieval or frequencies when it comes to rankings? So how, how these things work together with the st statistical models uh, we had? Like now we have, uh, for example, Lucene uses BM25, with, uh, which is a kind of statistical algorithm uh, for ranking. Um, so. This is not really low hanging fruit. It's not so low, um, and um, the the thing we can do and uh, the the experiments I've done. By the way, um, I've started kind of the same way as Doug started. So, um, is the there is this uh, hype about um, word to vec and the embeddings and the neural networks and stuff like that. So. Uh, does that really work in the context of search? Uh, so let's see. And uh, I encourage you to try it out and uh, think about not just um, as these uh, tools as a kind of magic, but as things that we need to understand uh, in order to make them useful for, for us at the end of the day. And um, um, to jump a bit forward, I think in terms of uh, ex my experience in terms of retrieval is that terms and vectors and frequencies and distances in the embedding space uh, uh, work well together. So the, the old knowledge and the old uh, models, old so to say, models work, work well in conjunction with this stuff. And um, you may realize that uh, each of these models uh, fill holes or gaps in the algorithms uh, from the other model. Great. So I think some things I think about, and again, this is the frontier, so we're thinking about how we can push this, and I actually like sharing, I could go and probably silly get a patent for some of these ideas, I'm sure, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who's thought of this stuff. But I really like to share, if I have an idea, I want to share it out there as much as, much as possible. And one of the thoughts, you know, crazy idea I had is, can you take this and build relevance-based embeddings? Can we take our, get to like a single vector space? So often, you know, we keep talking about vector spaces. Can we use deep learning to learn the, not just the, the document vector space or the vector space of the searcher to get one vector space that sort of a similarity will get tell you query document similarity uh, in, in one space. And one thing you think about is, can we use this negative sampling to get uh, sort of a relevance-based embedding? Because we have a lot of supervised data, right? Often, if you're doing any learning to rank, you might know that this document is relevant and these are irrelevant. Can you, learn, can you do the same negative sampling technique I just showed you to learn to push push this one, this vector space for Bitcoin in the document so that it will, when exposed to a query it's relevant for, it will return closer to one. And when it's exposed to a query it's not relevant for, it will uh, return something closer to zero. You could. Of course, the challenge is these embeddings are not generalizable. They're based on queries and documents we've already seen. We're maintaining a giant table of these things. So we hope we need to have a lot of data to store 
okay, all of the Bitcoin embeddings and all the document embeddings, that sort of thing. Which, if you're doing embeddings anyway, perhaps you're already doing that. Um, can we pre-train, you know, if we pre-train with our corpus or our sessions and then start to tweak, that's another idea. So maybe we start with almost like a Bayesian prior of this is what our corpus says and then keep making, uh, having an evolution, maybe even an evolutionary approach over time to move our embeddings away from the document space and towards the searcher space. It's another thought. Um, <clears throat> I think, too, one thing you can do is just take our, your query vectors and sort of average them closer. You know the documents that are relevant for them and just move them into the document space. So if you know that Bitcoin hype is in this, in this area, then you can average the relevant documents and get a, push it into sort of the document embedding space. So one thing I wanted to mention, and, and I thought of this as I was in the mo mobility talk, he talked about RankNet as a, that's a sort of a LTR learning, uh, neural network LTR implementation. But one thing I do want to mention, this is sort of another low hanging fruit, is in, in learning to rank implementations, embeddings are often some of the best features that people get gained from. I've heard that from multiple people in teams independently. So I want you guys to, you know, realize this, you may, be able to take this data and use it in the context of learning to rank along with traditional features like Tommaso says and traditional relevance work to get something uh, to help yourself. So let's see if we can do this in 14 minutes and do a demo. Um, language models. So language models are about predicting text. And what I'm gonna talk about in this in, my, in the next session is you know, embeddings are a great way to get started, but language models, I think, especially rec rec uh, recurrent neural network-based language models, I think in five years should, are going to be things in every search engineer's toolbox. And I'm really excited about them. And what language models do is basically, if you're not familiar, they're predicting text, uh, eat pizza. And you may say, well, this will obviously make sense if I'm texting someone and I want to auto-suggest. But it also makes sense if you have existing text and you're like, what goes with this text? Like, you know, you can almost imagine a graph of this thing might inspire this next thing, which might inspire this next thing. So there's a lot of capability there for, um, for doing some expansion. And <clears throat> when people teach about uh, recurrent neural networks, they often start with saying why regular deep learning doesn't work well for it. But I think it's actually maybe because I'm come from a search background, it's actually easier to start from a traditional language model like a Markov language model. And a Markov model, it, basically you can think about it as just a transition matrix. If we start with eat, there is a high probability of eat pizza, there is a very low probability of eat nap, and a slightly higher probability of eat chair, just because it's a noun, right? Um, <clears throat> cat, high probability of nap, low probability of cat and hopefully no one's eating cat pizza. So you can imagine this as like if I have a word, I can predict the next one. You can also then say, oh, if I do eat pizza, I might say, okay, well, what comes after pizza? And I could say, oh, maybe there's another word. And you can keep like generating text forever and back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of silly web things like automatically generating research papers that I think more or less were based on this kind of approach. <clears throat> now, the next question is, you start to think, what if I represent my word as an embedding? So here's the eat embedding. Can I build a transition matrix that gives me the embedding of the next word? And indeed, with a Markov model, if you have, you can actually sort of do this. You, you get kind of weights, and you might learn these weights through back propagation, of what's the best way, and again, if we're gonna do basically a dot product. If we look at, uh, if we have this kind of embedding, and we say, okay, how much should, for position zero, how much for position one of the source of embedding count? And, and so on and so forth. And so you, can, you take this and you, and you can multiply it through and get the embedding of the next word. So transition matrices need not strictly apply to, to that. Um, in both of these cases, okay, that's interesting, but in both of these cases, 
really require context. So far, we've just looked at the word before. And the weakness for these language models is we don't know that the race is on eat dust, right? So if we have some context, we know dust is very likely to be a word in this sentence. So how do we get context? <clears throat> so an old embedding, this is just what I showed you. If we have the eat embedding, we can sort of predict the embedding of the next word. So this is sort of a, the transition. We're going from input to the next word. Okay, so this is just what I showed you before. And the next, the question becomes, can I use this information about the past state to do something sort of with to predict the next state? And okay, we get the next word, pizza, maybe comes through here. Input, again, this is another transition matrix. I just put dot, dot, dot to a new embedding to predict what might go there. Right? It's everything we've done so far. And then this kind of interesting thing happens. If we could think about almost two transition matrices that go from previous context to new context, that also bleeds in the current, what we just fed in as input, we could somehow learn the right way through machine learning to balance those together and come create the next context. And so on and so forth. And I haven't used the word neural network yet. And then you could have sort of a prediction of the output embedding. It need not even be embeddings. You could actually just have a large set of vocabulary, but embeddings are usually used. <clears throat> and at any state, you can say, OK, what's the likely word at, at this point, given what we've seen before? And you can keep doing this pattern over and over. And you know what the right embedding should be because you know the words that go in each spot. So with that right knowledge at each output, you can do back propagation to learn all of these weights to get your model increasingly accurate. <clears throat> in other words, we might have the simpler view, races on eat. And we do all of these things. Here's our x to hidden, x to hidden, x to hidden. And then finally, we output something. Um, and we have our transitions at each hidden state. And this is really just what our current neural network is. It's really a set of Markov models chained together where you learn all the transitions uh, through back propagation. Now, it, for search, another low-hanging fruit is it's obvious to imagine how we might in inject contextually relevant items into here using this sort of model. Um, and of course, it's not necessarily a silver bullet because we're still in the situation. We've, we've, we're able to model our corpus well or maybe our searcher's vocabulary, but we're still in the situation where we're not, we're not learning the ideal sort of language model that connects both of them. <laughs> and that's where we get to, and I think this is really where this stuff gets really exciting. So, of course, we can make our sessions documents, right? This is a very common thing to do. You can build embeddings just in that query space. And <clears throat> I sort of already said this, we could have our document search term, and we could do uh, this sort of LTR sorts of things. But what is really interesting is this new, new exciting field of neural translation. Um, and this is an encoder-decoder uh, uh, framework. You hear this sort of thing. And we have like the races on. Um, and there says German. Should I try it, Rene? Renin ist in. Good. Okay. Uh, and what we, what you're doing here is you start and you get sort of this hidden state between one neural network and another that primes the next neural network when you're doing recurrent neural networks. And that actually is enough information, it turns out, to begin to translate this information. Um, you do enough training with the actual translation, and it, this neural network becomes a translator of sorts. Uh, and it's kind of, it's kind of amazing how, how that works. And by the way, I'm talking about recurrent neural networks. Uh, there are many architectures of RNNs that I'm just not going to get into in this talk. 
there's a great blog article, Seek to Seek the Clown Car of Deep Learning. So you can imagine, could we translate our documents to queries? Could we take a document animal control law and we know what queries might come out and we can sort of do this sort of translation between the two languages? And can our ranking be a sense of how likely this, uh, this is going to happen? How likely this is gonna be relevant or not relevant? I think, I think we can. I don't know if anyone's really doing this anywhere. The other thing is, can we use graded judgments? <laughs> and of course, these predictions are sort of, uh, and you can think of them as word embeddings for the words we're predicting, or they would actually be um, the vocabulary, probability distribution over a large vocabulary. And you can imagine we might weight our training samples, so what should come out at any given point, based on some notion of relevance to say, these, these are actually, this is very important for this document, these are moderately important, and that sort of thing. So that's another possibility, I think, that could be exciting. <clears throat> the next level is this idea of thought vectors that you might hear about. And this is something called skip thought ve vectors, which is a kind of sentence to vec. And this is interesting because queries often come in this form of this stuff on the right. There are a, little, there are a couple terms, they're not huge. And you can even think about this as uh, <clears throat> possibly a way to um, look before and after what the user is typing in a query box. We, type, we send in uh, its fleece was white as snow, and the idea with sentence to vec, or you seek to, uh, uh, these vectors, with a sentence before and sentence after, what this becomes is sort of a embedding for the sentence. It's sort of encoding the semantic meaning before and after. <clears throat> and I think about this as like, can you look across queries across user sessions and do a similar kind of thing. Could we take uh, one user's query that occurred before or after and sort of see some kind of relationship there or relationship between the document and those queries? And I don't know, I think there's a lot of, this is about the frontier, right? I, I encourage all of you to, to work on this. So I'm not sure we're actually have We're time. gonna try. Okay, go Just for it. Just one minute. And we're gonna, Tomas is gonna do a quick demo. We should have scheduled four hours for this talk. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as I said before, um, I think um, the core idea here is that we, uh, we are not sure yet if that's going to be a silver bullet. So, um, the demo is about bringing some kind of scientific view on, on this thing um, with experiments. And the other thing is about uh, showing things, how the things work out uh, in real life with real data. So um, I've uh, basically used um, stuff from this project, which is called Lucene for IR, uh, which from um, from a university. It's basically Lucene, uh, a set of tools to to uh, experiment with. Um, uh, do experiments with Lucene, and um, but uh, there are uh, more than, than this out there. There is also this tool called Ansarini, which is basically has the same the same idea. Um, so um, I've used um, uh, this uh, the data set from the Association of Computer Ma Machinery, uh, which is a small one. It is just uh, three thousand uh, docs. And basically, I've um, made um, running uh, all these docs uh, indexing and searching using different ranking models. So basically, using BM25, uh, TFIDF, uh, and uh, some other uh, similarity classes that are available in Lucene, together with uh, um, word embeddings and paragraph vectors. And since we don't have uh, time, I will uh, directly go to the results. Uh, this code's all up on GitHub, too. So, so um, I don't know if this show uh, reads up very well. But basically, uh, what we have is that uh, there is, uh, skip the, the second line for, for a second, it's the cla the, basically the um, uh, NDCG uh, column is second column is basically between uh, basically the higher is the, the highest is the better and we have that um, 
classic similar similarity, which is uh, TFIDF basically um, um, performed better than anyone else. So it's a surprise. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, uh, BM25 is very low, uh, diverged from randomness, which is another model, it's kind of low as well. And paragraph vector and word, word vector uh, ranking models uh, are slightly uh, below um, classic similarity. So uh, it doesn't work, uh, but it, it's not really the, uh, the case. So uh, we, we have 3,000 docs, which is really not enough for, I mean, in, this is kind of true for most of machine learning. We, we need uh, quite some, some stuff, quite some data. And um, so this first result was, uh, was um, generated um, uh, retrieving the first 100 relevant, possibly relevant documents for each query. And uh, for um, such a small data set, this was probably not, not the right choice. So let's see um, what happens uh, when we have um, uh, 10, when we retrieve only the top 10. And uh, with top 10, we have that, um, again, um, we have that classic is slightly uh, over uh, paragraph vectors, but not that much anymore. And um, Surprisingly enough, this uh, LTS thing is a small regression model uh, that uses a neural network to basically uh, use uh, statistics about, uh, about terms uh, to learn to score uh, in an unsupervised way. And actually, that was um, the turnout to, uh, to perform the better. Uh, but as I said, uh, at, at a certain point, the best comes with uh, mixing the old knowledge, so to say, with the new knowledge. And um, so mixing the paragraph vectors uh, ranking together with language modeling, Dirichlet uh, uh, similarity uh, performed uh, best um, slightly below word vector with BM25. So this is the kind of uh, experiments I encourage you to do. Um, when it comes to your search projects. So really try out different things, uh, think about the data you have and what kind of things might sense or might not sense to use. So in this, in this case, probably 3,000 docs is not enough uh, for paragraph vectors and word vectors based rankings to outperform alone uh, the basic models. Uh, so I tried to make it as quick as possible. So uh, the other thing is, um, I've pre we've prepared a small demo using Flink to uh, ingest uh, tweets uh, about those tags there, uh, Berlin Buzzword, Berlin Buzzword 2008, Lucene, Deep Learning, whatever, and uh, store them into continu continuously uh, uh, index them and run um, a prefixed query against them to see how the relevance changes over time when, and, and what kind of results we have. And uh, with my uh, ugly uh, jQuery uh, capabilities, I kind of made this uh, ongoing CSV, basically. So you can see that uh, so the query we run is something about, about neural search, deep learning. Uh, and at first, we have the PM25 uh, return this, uh, this as, the, as the top tweet. And uh, class, classic, which is TFIDF, deep learning and fonts. Uh, and document rankings uh, return the same as PM25. But basically, um, going down, so we have that uh, BM25 just loves deep learning. and. Um, Document embeddings, uh, Michael Jordan, not the one from the basketball player, warns us that deep learning is going to be lead to bad medical whatever. So it's, uh, and this is the kind of uh, things that uh, is important to, to do in real life. So uh, as the data changes, see how the relevance changes and what kind of documents you get, if they're relevant or not. And um, if you look uh, again, uh, language model Dirichlet uh, basically returns the first top results that it used to return at the first time. So it doesn't adapt. It seems it is less flexible than the uh, document embedding ranking um, to the uh, to the data that changes in the index. So that's something that, for, for example, that's that's one quick thing to 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 learn from this this quick experiment. And since we have no more time, or kind of no more time, I'm going to. 
uh, skip the other parts. Yeah, so we're going to go to the end. Yes. And I think we'll get clapped off soon. Uh, so basically, I think some takeaways for us for this are, you know, mixing, there's no silver bullet, you know, there's no magic cognitive search unicorns that are going to come and save your, everyone's jobs or take everyone's jobs yet. Uh, one thing that I think is important to take away is we've only shown tokenizing text and anything can really be in an embedding space. Deep learning is good at representations of all of these things and vectors. And I talked about queries and documents. Queries can mean users. We can talk about images. All these things can be vector. And in relevant search, we say everything can be tokenized. And I think those things very much dovetail. Uh, and Solar and ES community need to get better at first class vector support. Raise your hand if you know about Vespa. So some people, okay, Vespa does this very well. And Solar and ES sort of, it's kind of painful to get this yeah. to work. So in the, in the API, you can see there is, uh, it's very hard to, to see how can I fit a vector into that API. So, uh, I mean, that's something that probably will, will or will not evolve over time, but it's something to think about. So how to, 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 to make these changes also in the software we use. Uh, is this, is this, everything we've done is in supervised learning. Is this going to be the future? And we haven't really, how much do you do with unsupervised learning versus learning trank where there's clicks and you have a lot of labeled data? Can we do better with unsupervised learning? I mean, all of these things are questions. And finally, uh, I, there's this Slack community that we have. We talk about search relevance issues. I really encourage everyone to join. We talk about plugins. There's even a jobs board. There's conferences. We, of course, hope that everyone knows about Haystack, our conference uh, that the community did. Book authors are there to talk about directly at these issues. So please join us there if you have questions. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry sorry we to interrupt over. you. Let's finish.